open your Bibles to John's Gospel, chapter 9. And, <coughs> excuse me, we're going to look at just a few verses, starting with verse 39 through 41. Don Nesbitt, YouTube. I'm entitling this a Damning Delusion. Damning Delusion. There's a lot of things that damn you <laughs> in life. Uh and, and uh, make life very miserable for people. Uh, it's sin. At the root of it all is sin. And uh, without God's medicine, which is Jesus Christ, it leads to a bitter end. Hell, hell is real. And all who enter there abandon all hope. Now the delusion here that the Lord is going to point out to the Pharisees just increased their anger, their hatred, and their determination to get rid of this preacher from Galilee, this upstart who was going around causing real problems for the religious establishment. And believe me, uh, he gave them enough ammunition uh, for them to hate him. Uh... Now, what does he say here in verse 39? He's talking about spiritual blindness, spiritual blindness, which I had as a Catholic, which religious people have. I've, I've had them come to my door here in Pensacola, uh, Jehovah Witnesses and Mormons, and try and explain to them why they're damned without the new birth. Very hard to get that across. They're blind. They've been blinded by the enemy. And he's done a good job. He's, they actually have, I believe, religious devils. Uh, I, I, I dealt with Jews in New York, I, as I've said many times on occasion. And uh, the problem there is the refusal to acknowledge that without a blood sacrifice, they can't make atonement with God. And that blood sacrifice is found in the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. And that's why the temple was removed, as the Lord prophesied. And they have no temple system. And uh, they come back with the idea, well, I'm doing good works and I hope to please God that way. I says, well, that doesn't work. You could do all the good works you want and you wind up pleasing yourself more than you please God because people have a tendency to feel good about themselves when they do religious works. But nowhere is it written that that's going to make you right with God, that that's an atonement. The Bible I says, in your Bible, Torah, it says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. You, you must have a blood sacrifice, and you don't have one. You don't have a temple. But uh, they keep clinging to that idea. Well, what am I supposed to do if I don't have a temple? And uh, What else can I do? I, I'll do good works. I'll do works of charity. And I says, well, that's, that's fine. But uh, I says, the prophet, your prophet, okay, said, all your righteousness is as filthy rags, saith the Lord. So all the things you're going to do to please God in living a strict, moral, Torah-observant life is not going to cut it. It's just, it's, it's, God can't accept it. There's only one perfect righteousness which you can have, which comes free by faith in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He's the end of the law. He was the perfect man, the sinless man. He has a righteousness that no other man can come close to. And you and I can't work it out. We can't earn it. We, can't. <laughs> we have to take it by faith from Jesus Christ, from God the Father, who offers it to us as a free gift. And that humbles man because man wants to believe that he's helping God save himself, save the man. And that's the whole idea behind these lodges and these religious things, uh, the masons and everything, these do-gooders, kingdom builders. And it turns out, and you read the Gospels carefully, that these religious people are the worst enemies of uh, Jesus Christ. The worst. And you wouldn't think that. You would think they would be inclined to wanting the truth uh, and, and pleasing God with the truth. No, they're not. And Paul wrote to the Galatians, am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Jesus, you got a problem with the truth because it cuts across what you want to believe. Now, what does he say in verse 39? And Jesus said, for judgment I am come into this world. <laughs> 
for judgment. What judgment? Well, you're with me or against me. There's no neutral ground. There's no gray. You're either going to accept my righteousness that I'm going to offer after I make the blood sacrifice on the cross, or you're not. You're going to be judged on that basis. When you go up before the Lord, it's not what you did, how many uh, dollars did you give to the poor or whatever. God the Father is interested in one thing only. That's his son. And the question will always be, what did you do with my son? I offered him to the world as a free gift, making sacrifice uh, to atone for the sins of the world that you could not make. You and all the world together could not make atonement. It had to be someone who was going to live perfectly, and that was going to be my own son. And that plan of God goes all the way back before the garden, before sin came into the world. Say, how so? Well, God in his foreknowledge, after making man and giving man a free will, did he not know that Adam and Eve were going to mess up? I mean, sure he knew it. Uh, so you say, well, he created them anyway, knowing it was going to be a disaster and bring in 6,000 years of human history of grief and woe. Yes, God knew that. But he had a plan. He had a plan to correct that. He gave man free will. He knew man was going to blow it, but he was going to give man another chance. This is a great God. He had a plan. So he allowed things to unfold with sin and misery, and that's a tough question. I know a lot of people think about that, and if he saw this coming, why did he allow it? Well, we'll get the whole story when we meet him, but he allowed it. And to this day, a Christian, you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit in you who wants to control you, but you have free will. He hasn't taken that away. In fact, the angels had it. Did they not rebel with Satan? Satan had it. Did they not rebel and choose to uh, go against a holy God and pursue their own aim? Sure they did. They had free will. God took a chance creating them. He knew what he was doing. So... So it's hard to understand, you know, you just, well, why did this have to happen? and Why did, did that have to happen? But we'll know when we get there. And Jesus said, for judgment am I come into this world, that they which see might not see. They which see. Well, who are these people which see? Religious people. What do they see? They see themselves as righteous and the others as unwashed <laughs> sinners. <laughs> especially if you came from Galilee in those days. <laughs> yeah, they see themselves as righteous and everybody else is just a, basically a loser struggling to please God. And that they which see might not see, and that they which see might be made blind. So they which see themselves as righteous are going to be made blind. And it already happens. They're made blind by their love of themselves and their pride and their idea that they are righteous. Now, you know who struggled with this? John's Gospel, chapter 3, and my hat's off to him. It bothered him so much that he had to go off on his own and talk to the Lord. He chose to do it at nighttime. I guess he didn't want uh, you know this thing to be brought out. Uh, there was some peer pressure, I'm sure. He uh, he might not have even told anybody in the Sanhedrin that uh, I'm going to talk to Jesus because I'm troubled. Uh, I just have a hard time understanding what's going on. That was Nicodemus. You see, now here's a man who's saying, look, I'm doing everything the law tells me to do. As far as I can, I'm living righteously according to the law. But now, and, and I've been doing this for years, here comes a man, a young man, Okay, he's, he's a rabbi, he's a teacher, and he's worked miracles, and everybody's talking about him. And when he preaches, uh, he preaches with authority. There's no hemming and horn, and this is gray, and that's not absolute. Uh, he's got something. He obviously has a relationship with God. Now, remember Nicodemus as a Jew didn't see Jesus Christ as God in the flesh. No, no Jew acknowledged that. But he says he obviously has a relationship with God that I don't have because I can't do the things that he does. And I'm not preaching and teaching with authority. I'm just trying to follow the Torah as best I can. I, I got to go talk to this guy. I, I got to find out what, what, what has he got? What's the deal here? Are you curious that way? 
Can you go through your whole life and never think about things that are so important as to your soul and the state of your soul and what's going to happen when it leaves your body? And Can you go through life so distracted until the day of death that these things never enter into your mind? You know, where did I come from? What's the purpose of me being here? Is there a God? What does he expect of me? Can you, if you're that sad, my God, uh, what did you do here except take up space and live a life of vanity? Say, so, well, I accomplish good things. For what purpose? And, and for whom? Whose benefit? Whose benefit? Oh, you left your people some money or something? You, you left a big endowment to the, uh, to the college you went to or whatever? I remember reading years ago when Roy Kroc, K-R-O-C, the, the guy who set up the Burger King, actually, Burger King franchise, his widow had died, and she left a huge amount of money, believe it or not, and my hat's off to her, to the Salvation Army. I think she left the largest bestowment that the Salvation Army had ever been given. Uh, did that get her in heaven? Well, if she wasn't born again, she's in hell. I don't care how many billions she left. You're not redeemed with gold or silver. Okay, you're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. But at least it went, well, the organization is not what it once was, unfortunately. Uh, but they do good. And God has a purpose for these organizations, these charities and things like the Salvation Army and everything. You know, when a person wants to do good but does not want to submit themselves to Jesus Christ and the authority of his word... God puts them aside. He puts them in these situations in life where they help mankind, like the Red Cross or whatever, and uh, build hospitals and go out and doing all kinds of good deeds. And then at the end, he says, I never know you. Depart from me, workers of iniquity. Uh, you and I, I never knew you. You and I never became intimate. We, we had no real relationship. We knew of each other, but, and you did these things in my name. That's commendable. But <laughs> I'll have to put it plainly. We never went to bed together. We never consummated anything. There was no real knowing of one another. And that's the thing. And that's the reason Jesus said that the road that leads to life is narrow. And few there are that find it. And the road that leadeth to destruction is broad. And many there are that go that way. It's hard to admit that sometimes, especially if you've been doing good all your life. When I worked in New York City, I had a hard time witnessing the civil servants or policemen, firemen, for that matter, uh, do-gooders, pe people that were uh, doing with their lives what they thought was very important, helping others, and that's commendable. But there was a certain pride there that I really found difficult to break through. As far as, and that's what the Lord is doing here with the Pharisees. He's trying to break through that pride. Look at verse 40. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Like, how dare you? Yeah, he's blind. Oh, what are you kidding? I mean, we see, we know the law. These ignorant people who don't know the law, they're the ones that are in trouble with God, but we know the law. Oh, you do, huh? Well, are we, are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now ye say, We see. Therefore your sin remaineth. Okay? If, if ye were blind, you should have, if you weren't truly aware of how bad off you are, you would have no sin. It's, it's like a person that's... Uh, you know, born retarded or whatever. You're not aware of your condition. You, you, they're not going to be charged with sin. If you were blind, you should have no sin. But you're not. First of all, you have the Torah, and you have the understanding that a prophet would come in Deuteronomy 18, and you would listen to him. Well, I've done many wonderful works proving that I'm that prophet. I am the truth that you need. I'm standing right in front of you. And uh, you, you, you refuse to see. If you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say, we see. What do you see? What do you see? You're already calling me a magician and a, a phony. What do you see? Wherefore your sin remaineth. In other words, you're going to die in your sins. 
You want to hold on to your robes of righteousness, regardless of what I'm telling you. You are not righteous, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In Ecclesiastes, there's none, we're all corrupt. We've all gone astray. Okay, can't you acknowledge that? But you say, no, we're okay. We're right with God. Are you? Are you? I posed that question to a Catholic priest once. With all the things you've done and the over the years and the retreats and the sacrifices of uh, uh, prayer, uh, could you say you're right with God? I said, no, no, I can't. Well, then what do you do? You keep doing these things in hope? You'll get right with him someday or what? I said, no answer. Well, this is what we have. We have to go with what we have. This is what God has given us. Well, good luck, pal. I've got something better. I've got a book that tells me it's complete. I've got a Savior who said, it is finished. My atonement has been made. Obviously, you're missing it. Amen? Amen. Open your Bibles, please, to Luke's Gospel, chapter 23. We'll look at verses 39 through 43, and I'll entitle this, The Medicine of Fear. Fear is a healthy thing when it leads you to do right. The Bible says we've not been given a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and a sound mind. But that is referring to the fear of going to hell. That's a, the fear that I had as a Catholic. If you don't please God, you're in trouble. We've not been given a spirit of fear because God is not our enemy anymore if you're saved. So we're not afraid. And uh, But that fear is a motivating thing. We, we, we fear God because the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You say, well, I don't, you know, uh, I'm not going to hold on to much fear because I know Jesus loves me. And well, amen. But <laughs> you're going to appear at the judgment seat of Christ one day. It might be sooner than we think. Hopefully he'll come. And there ought to be fear. There ought to be fear as to your record of service and how you're performing for the Lord or not performing. So that's a healthy fear that should motivate you. Now, you don't hear that preached much anymore, but fear is a good medicine. And the Lord talks about it in Hebrews, or the, the fathers, the earthly fathers we gave reverence to because they had the power to correct, chastise us, but for their own pleasure sometimes. Uh, but when God chastises us, it's, it's for the purpose of making us holy and fearing him. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. How does a rod comfort you unless it's used to give you a good whack when you need one? That's the comfort of knowing God cares enough about me to whack me. When I deserve a beating, my God shall supply all you need, whose riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Well, sometimes you need a beating, okay? Amen. We don't think of it that way. And God gives us what we need. So fear is a medicine for a believer. The right kind of fear, the godly fear, the fear God wants us to have. And I have said this to many Christians, and when they say, Brother Militello, what, what should I pray for in particular? Pray that God gives you an increase in the fear of him. That's a wonderful thing to ask for, besides wisdom and grace to get you through the trials and tribulations of this world and life. But pray for that holy fear. Thy word have I hidden mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Fear leads you to memorize scripture sometimes because you want to have something in your heart that's going to stand up. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. And fear, if you don't take heed, what's going to happen? People now are suffering, uh, locked away in jails and prisons throughout this country for just moments of craziness that they did. And then cost them 10, 20, 30 years or more locked away from society. For what? For acting crazy and letting their emotions and passions run wild? Did they fear being caught? Did they fear spending 20, 30 years in jail cut off from their families and whatever? I, I guess not. Or I, 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 they just don't think about it. We don't think about it when we do things. How's this going to affect my relationship with the Lord? That's something that ought to make you fear. So we have the medicine of fear. Look at verse 39. 
And one of the malefactors, which were hanged, railed on him, saying, if thou, be the, if thou be Christ, save thyself and us. Well, now, actually, both had begun uh, railing against him. You'll find that in Matthew 27, verse 44. Both of them started that way, railing against him. But one quit. One quit, and there was a change. You know the story, the thief on the cross that had quit. Now, my speculation is this. Uh, when he, I think what triggered that quitting and saying, well, enough is enough, I'm not going to rail on him anymore, because it says in verse 40, but the other answering rebuked him. Now, before he was going along with him, rebuked him, saying, dost thou not fear God? Good question. Seeing thou art in the same condemnation, in other words, we're lying, we're, we're dying, both of us here, he's dying, we're dying. Don't you fear God? Don't you are thinking about what's going to happen to you? Great question. But I think that when the Lord had said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, I think that might have turned that thief, one of them, uh, to Christ. You know, it's a, he probably says, what, what kind of statement is that coming from a man that's being murdered and butchered this way to forgive his enemies? I don't feel that way, even though maybe I, I justly deserve to be killed. Something happened, and possibly that thief, that thief had heard of Jesus Christ or had heard his preaching or someone told him about him. So something was already going on to turn him. And thank God he did because he was hours away from going to hell. Thank God he did. Whatever it was that turned him came just in time. You talk about a brand being plucked from the fire. <laughs> this is it here. This is what's happening with this guy. He's about to go to hell and bang oh, the mercy of God touches him. And how does it touch him? Uh, why does it touch him? Because there was that turning. There was that, number one, he quits railing. Number two, he turns to his partner in crime and rebukes him. Now, the Lord heard that. You look at this guy. He's, he's come, he's like the prodigal's son waking up and seeing all the pigs and everything and says, he came to himself. What am I doing here? What's going on here? What's the matter with me? What a wonderful thing conversion can be when you allow the words of God to affect you, come into your heart. What a wonderful thing. And I think it doesn't happen as often as we think it's happening with people. I think sometimes they just go along, and yes, I believe in God, and yes, I believe in Jesus, and I know all these things about him or whatever. But you wonder sometimes, they really get converted? You know, uh, could you be saved and not be zealous or passionate for the Lord? Yes, I know that. But it's a little disheartening sometimes that people who claim to be God's children and servants of the Lord... There's something missing. There's something, something happens. The, the conversion is, it's like taking food half-baked out of the oven. It's, it's not really done. You know, when you're eating something, you know, oh, this should have been left in the oven more. This isn't cooked right. All right. And the other rebuked him. Oh, we got that. And verse 41. And we, he's talking about himself and the other uh, thief here. We, for, we, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. Okay. Now, now this certifies to me. Number one, he's honest. We're getting it. He's agreeing with the authorities. We're getting, uh, we're getting punished for what we did. We're receiving the due reward. But he must have heard about Jesus Christ. He must have known about Jesus Christ in some way. But this man had done nothing amiss. Now, maybe he heard Pilate. Maybe he saw Pilate wash his hands and say, having nothing to do with the blood of this just man. Maybe there was something that he observed or had heard about and said, this guy's innocent. Maybe he had heard that Barabbas, a murderer, was uh, allowed to go free and Jesus was being uh, murdered. And he probably couldn't understand that. If anybody deserved to be on the cross, it was Barabbas. Everybody knew what he was. But this Jesus, what was he, a preacher? 
He went around doing good. I mean, he must have heard stories about him. But this man had had done nothing amiss, nothing wrong. What a comment to say about our Savior. Not one wrong thing did he did. And he said unto Jesus, see, at that point, acknowledging his guilt and not turning away from the punishment that was due him, wow, he turns to Jesus and he's ready to say, Lord, Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. He must have heard preaching. He must have heard preaching. Well, he heard Jesus on the cross. The things that he said to the Lord that must have impressed him, especially, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What father? There was no father around there watching Jesus get executed. He must have thought, this, this guy's father is in heaven. Maybe he is from heaven. Lord. What? Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Yeah, if you're talking this way in the face of death, and a horrible death at that, you've got something I know nothing about, but I'd like to know. What is it you have that you could face death this way? What is it? How many Roman spectators sitting in the the Colosseum or other arenas watching these Christians going off to their death at the hands of being lit on fire, uh, being torn apart by lions and God knows what other wild beasts. And here are these people holding hands until they get to their place of execution, singing songs and glorifying God. Now you're sitting in the stands watching this. You mean to tell me you're not looking at that and saying, wow, what do these people have? And what do they know that I don't know that they could be facing a horrible death like this singing? Don't you think that turns some people around? I should think so. I should think so. I think a lot of those Roman citizens and others went home after watching that spectacle and wondering and thinking about it and going to bed at night and saying, wow, these people are strange. Peculiar isn't the word. They're way out there. Or they know something that I don't know. So now you know why the Christians had to meet secretly at night, sometimes in these catacombs and tunnels and places, because there must have been a lot of inquirers, like Nicodemus coming at night. Let's say you knew of somebody next door who uh, you thought might have been a Christian and they were related to somebody that went to the, that was executed in the arena and you wanted to know more and you went to that family next door and said, now, I, what is it you, he believed or she believed? I, I was amazed what I saw today. I, I can't get it out of my head. What is it? And if the God put it on their heart and they trusted you and they'd say, well, here's the faith that we believe in. And you had to be very secret about it uh, because that was a time of great persecution. But, you know, that that inquisitiveness, that curiosity, that uh, sense of what what is it that you have? You're different from me. You, you seem to take things more calmly. Things that upset other people don't seem to upset you. Things that annoy you don't annoy me. Uh, you're offended by people uh, taking the name of the Lord in vain. Me, I hear it all the time. It doesn't I'm used to it. it doesn't bother me. What, why are these things, what, what are these things that bother you and don't bother me? And why is that so? You know, you become curious and you ask these questions and hopefully by the Spirit of God, you're led to the truth. And a lot of people are led to the door of the truth, but don't go in. Now, why am I saying that? Because I've known some. I've known some that have been inquiring and inquiring, ever seeking ever learning, never coming to the knowledge of the truth. What is it that holds them back? Can I put forward this speculation? It's that sense of, I like my life, and I don't want it changed. I'm kind of enjoying myself, or have things in my life that I suspect would have to be taken away or changed or whatever. I'm not ready for that. Maybe later on. There is no later on. You don't know if there'll be a later on. But they just get as close as you can possibly get to the door of salvation. And the Lord opens that door somewhat. They see light. They see light. But they refuse to open the door all the way and go into the light. 
they step back into the darkness of the vanity of their own mind. And unless somebody reaches out to them later on or whatever, they go, die, and go to hell. And boy, imagine spending your eternity in hell thinking about how close you were and how you saw the truth and said, no, no, not for me. That's why I like that song. Come, come as I, just as I am. The song they would always sing at the Billy Graham Crusades at the end of it, just as I am, meaning don't worry about what's going to change or not change. Just come the way you are and trust the Lord to do what he wants to do. Can't you do that instead of having all these things pop up in your mind by the devil? You can't this and you can't that. I think I'll end it with this. I told that story about the drunk at the uh, crusade that had uh, listened to the message and was moved and was crying and was getting up out of his uh, seat. But as he got up out of his seat, he had that uh, in his pocket. The usher noticed uh, a bottle of four roses, <laughs> whiskey. So uh, the usher had said, uh, no, I think you need to need to leave this on your chair or just get rid of it. This is not going to help you much now where you're going. You're going down to the altar to have a prayer. And he couldn't do it. He says, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't leave this behind. I don't know if it'll be here when I get back. <laughs> that was a crazy thing, but th this is me. This is part of me. And uh, I'm not ready to let that go. Well, you might be thinking of that right now about being saved. I'm not ready to let this or that go. Try it. Go down there without the gambling and the, and the sins that you enjoy or whatever it is. And just put it aside for a while and meet the Lord in that place of prayer and say, Lord, help me. I'm having trouble letting stuff go, but I want to I wanna get right. He'll do it. He'll help you. He knows what you need better than what you know you need. Amen and amen.